Well, we're jumping into Ecclesiastes chapter 6, looking at this uh, big section from 6 verse 10 to 7 verse 14. And the sermon I preached on this section, I called, If Only I Could Handle Bad Times Better. Now, if you haven't already done so, please take some time to read through this section a few times for yourself. Uh, pray that God would open your eyes to to see and understand glorious truths about Him and about life in His world and how we can live in a way that is increasingly glorifying to Him. As always, I'm going to highlight just some of the important things that I've uh, seen in this text to just give you some handles to both read and understand uh, this portion of God's Word better. And my hope and prayer is that this would help you to mature as a disciple of Jesus mature in your understanding of his word so that you might live increasingly as a mature disciple of Jesus. Now Ecclesiastes 6 verse 10 uh, starts the second half of the book of Ecclesiastes. The first uh, half was in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 12 after the introduction in the first 11 verses all the way through to chapter 6 verse 9 and in those uh, opening in that opening section uh, we we saw the question, what is good for people to do? And over and over again, we saw the repetition of the phrase, it was like chasing after the wind. The last time that we see that phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes is in chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, After that, we don't see any repetition uh, of that phrase, chasing after the wind. And now this second half starts here in chapter 6, verse 10. And it's going to take us all the way through to chapter 11, verse 6. Uh, After that, we'll get Mr. Teacher's conclusion. And the key questions that we are dealing with in this big second section of Ecclesiastes are the questions that are asked here. Who knows what is good for a mortal to do during their few and meaningless days? And the second question, who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone. Now, just to see some of the repetition that we've seen in the book so far, this idea of uh, meaningless, the less the meaning, uh, is obviously very well known in the book of Ecclesiastes as he starts meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And here too, we see a little bit of that uh, repetition, uh, the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow. And also just to remember that in the book of Ecclesiastes, Mr. Teacher is giving us an under the sun perspective. So he's looking horizontally. He's trying to understand life from the perspective of a mortal living under the sun. And in a lot of the book, he's trying to work out what wisdom truly looks like. Uh, What is a wise life going going to look like under the sun? Uh, Back in chapter 3, verse 1 to 15, we saw the poem about time, a time for this and a time for that. And we saw that God is sovereignly in charge of both the good times and the bad times. Now, this section in 7, verse 1 to 14, seems to offer practical advice on how to respond to that poem about time. And an interesting thing we'll see here is that over and over again, Mr. Teacher tells us things that are better. And it's surprising what he tells us is better. The same root word is uh, translated here as good. So why do I say that it's surprising what we see here? Well, Mr. Teacher wants us to see that it is better to go into our house of mourning than to go into a house of feasting. The day of death is better than the day of birth. And so very much the focus of these first four verses in chapter 7 are are showing us that actually the house of mourning is a better teacher than the house of feasting. Uh, A coffin is a better teacher than a cot. And why does he say this? Well, because death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Uh, He's showing us that actually under the sun in our meaningless days, they'll pass like a shadow and death is coming. Death is the destiny of everyone. 
the living should take this to heart. And we see a number of repetitions of uh, things to do with our hearts. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the, house, the heart of the fool is in the house of pleasure. So there's a contrast here between uh, the foolish and the wise. And Mr. Teacher wants us to see that living wisely is much better than living foolishly. But not only is it better to be in a house of mourning, uh, just this reminder that death is the destiny of everyone, not only do we need that reminder, but there's a few other things that are better. It's better to be rebuked than to listen to the song of fools. Now that sounds counterintuitive for us, uh, but a rebuke from a wise person is better than just listening to foolish songs all day long. We also see here that the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience is better than pride. This is patience in the spirit is better than the pride of spirit. Mr. Teacher also focuses in on anger, and he says that anger resides in the lap of fools. So don't get angry, don't be quickly provoked. And Mr. Teacher is also challenging us to live in the present rather than dwelling on the good old days. Saying, do not say, why were the, good old, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Uh, to complain about the degeneration of our time is to show a lack of patience and self-control, which is the mark of a fool, rather than the mark of somebody who's truly wise. But the interesting thing in here is he's trying to show us how to handle bad times better. The bad times of death, he's saying actually they're a really good teacher. Uh, the bad times of being rebuked are a better teacher. And then he says here, wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Uh, there is an advantage to knowledge because wisdom preserves the life of those who have it. So in these opening 11, uh, 12 verses of chapter 7, uh, he's contrasting things that are better. How can you handle bad times better? But actually, on either side of those 12 verses, uh, we have these two sections that actually help us to understand the middle section more fully. And what we see in these two sections is that he brings God into the conversation. Now, you might wonder, well, God's name isn't mentioned here, but God is the one who names things. God is the one who knows things. God is the someone who is stronger. He is the one who knows what's good for a person. He is the one who can tell what will happen uh, after they're gone. So although uh, God isn't mentioned in the same way that he's mentioned here in these opening verses, uh, he is the one on both sides of this middle section He's the one who, who frames the whole section. You see, God is the one who named all things. Just go and read Genesis 1 and 2 at creation. We see God naming things. God is the one who knows uh, all about humanity. All our ways are known to him. God is the stronger one. And we can't contend with him. Uh, verse 11 here, the more words, the less meaning. You can't argue with God. How does it profit you to try and argue with the stronger one, the one who knows all things, the one who named all things, saying the more words, the less meaning. Don't argue with God. It won't get you anywhere. And from our perspective, under the sun, we don't know what's good for a person in their life, but God does. Our lives pass like a shadow. He is the eternal one. Now, who can tell a person what will happen under the sun after they're gone? No human can, but God can. So God is in view in these opening verses and then God is in view afterwards. He says, consider what God has done. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. And this good here is the same word as 
Now, wisdom is a good thing. When times are good, it's the same root word as what we see repeated here, better. When times are better, be happy. When times are good, be good is a more literal translation, but be happy. But when times are bad, what should we do when times are bad? How can we handle the bad times better? Well, he says, consider this. So we've got here, consider what God has done, and then consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. God has made the good and the bad. He's in charge of both of these days, all of these times, all of these seasons that we saw in chapter 3. God is sovereign over all of them. We can't discover anything about our future, but we can know the one who knows the future. And the big thing that we see in all of this, through all these bad times, is that often the most important lessons in life are learned through the hardest seasons of life, but we'll only learn the important lessons through the hardest seasons when we look to the one who is sovereignly in control of those times, both the good times and the bad times. We will only learn the important lessons in life, the lessons that are to be learnt in the house of mourning, the lessons that are to be learnt through the rebuke of a wise person, the lessons that are to be learnt about anger and being patient rather than prideful, the lessons of not just looking back to the old days, but actually living in the present and longing for the future. We'll only learn these important lessons through the hardest seasons of life when we look to the one who is sovereignly in control of these times, both the good times and the bad times. And I think that is the big thing that Mr. Teacher wants us to see in this section. Now, as we work through this section, uh, it's, it's a very raw section. It makes us think about the hardest seasons of our lives, the times when we've been in the house of mourning, when we've been rebuked, uh, when we've been struggling with anger, when we haven't been wise. And it's challenging us and saying, well, how could you handle the bad times better? You need to handle them with the right perspective. Consider what God has done. Now, as we consider what God has done this side of the cross, the wonder, the glory is that we know that God came in the person of Jesus into a world that was bad and struggling in the house of mourning. People were dying. People were struggling with anger. Jesus came so that he could fix the mess that we had made. He is the one who fixes our perspective, and he's the one who will ultimately help us to learn the important lessons in life through the hardest seasons of life as we look to him who is sovereignly in control over these times. And the apostles reflect on this. A great chapter to go and read is Romans chapter 8 where Paul tells us that our present suffering is not, com is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, and that God is working for the good of those who trust in him. Even in the difficult times, God is working for our good. And the big thing we are to learn here is that we need to trust him. And as we trust him, we need to pray that we will learn these important lessons through the hardest seasons as we look to him who is sovereignly in control knowing that one day bad times will come to an end. One day there won't be a house of mourning to go to. There won't be any need to be rebuked because the old would have gone. Our tears would have been wiped away. The bad and the sad will be a thing of the past. They'll no, be, no longer be struggling with, with anger or struggling with being a fool. We're longing for that day and we need to pray that God would give us the wisdom in this day to live in a way that is pleasing to him when times are good being happy enjoying those times when times are bad trusting him knowing that he is sovereignly in control and one day we'll be with him well as you continue to dig into this section i pray that the lord would open your eyes to see and understand these truths about him and may god bless your time as you dig in further